Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, and uh, thank you both, uh, Alexis and, and Jeremy, for putting this together. I have the utmost respect for the Institute of the Americas, and I know you both personally, and on the basis of the friendship, I also thank you, thank you for giving Carlos and I the opportunity of uh, sharing with your audience uh, the results of this uh, presentation that eventually was transformed into a paper. The, the paper is available, it has the same title, and that will, uh, if you uh, put that on your browser, that will lead you to the IDB uh, publication section, uh, and you can download it from, from there. Uh, th this is the second of, uh, of three presentations, actually, that we have prepared for the IDB Board of Directors to explain what is happening into the, the uh, world petroleum market. And for that, we try to answer a few, uh, some three basic questions that uh, it's our first slide. The first is uh, most commodities, actually all commodities, but for oil, began declining together with uh, uh, lower, lower economic growth both worldwide and particularly in Asia since 2011. You can see that and we will show that. However, oil uh, remained remarkably stable at around $100 a barrel and then it fell uh, precipitously in the second half of uh, last, last year. It began falling in, in uh, July and then there were two discrete uh, drops. One when in uh, September 9th, just a year ago today, uh, in the joint uh, uh, World Bank IMF fall meeting, uh, it, uh, the IMF revised downwards the growth prospects for, for both the world economy and, uh, and uh, uh, Asia and China's uh, economies. And, and they were quite right. The economies have uh, grown much faster than, much uh, slower than first thought. And the second discrete drop in price came on uh, uh, November 27th, when in Vienna, in a regular meeting of OPEC, uh, uh, led by Saudi Arabia, uh, OPEC decided not to open market space for additional or incremental US uh, uh, crude production and that uh, uh, put in motion a, 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 a market share growth, a uh, war that uh, we're uh, going through that at this very moment. That's, that's the first question. Why did the, 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 the price of oil not fall before? And then why it fell so, so in such a pronounced manner in, uh, uh, since the July last uh, year? And the third question is if this new price scheme is stable. And, uh, and, 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 and our argument is that it is. And that we're in the process, it, it is emerging for the first time, I would say, in, in, in more than a century since uh, the uh, 1880s when the Standard Oil uh, took uh, monopoly control or oligopoly control of the, world petroleum, of the US petroleum market we never had had such a competitive market as we have today. And, uh, and uh, w this is our main conclusion, that the, the, we'll have a, a big marginal producer now that will be the, the hundreds of people producing uh, non-traditional uh, oil in the US. And, and it's the productivity of those producers that will fix the, the, the price of oil uh, moving forward. We'll, we'll argue that all along the presentation. The, the, re the reasons for this conclusion are uh, four, it's fourfold. Uh, first, uh, uh, there is increasing productivity in non-conventional uh, 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 crude production in the US. Second, uh, Saudi Arabia has declared war and is increasing, has been increasing production. And there are other countries within, uh, within OPEC that have uh, shot in capacity for non-economic reasons, uh, namely 
Libya, that is in the midst of a war, and, uh, and Iran because of the, the sanctions that are just being lifted. And the fourth is that there are other producers, namely Iraq, that will increase uh, production at whatever price. Then let's develop these, uh, answer the questions, and develop the, the conclusion from now on. This is the, the price of uh, crude oil. Uh, uh, and, and, and the first point is how remarkably stable was the price. There were some fluctuations, but around uh, 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 an average of $96, very close to $100. And then the, the sudden drop over the last uh, G, over the last 15 months or so, with the two steep uh, drops in in September last year, and then again in November and and more and the more recent one we're witnessing at this moment. Then the first uh, question we want to answer is is why those prices were so stable at around this $100 mark, and. And uh, the, the, this is the evidence as compared to other commodities. Uh, you can see there clearly how metals and minerals, food, uh, began a, a downtrend in uh, early uh, 2011. And that was not the, cra the case for energy, namely uh, oil. Uh, um, and uh, this is uh, the, the change, the relative change vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, 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 2011 by uh, mid-2014. Uh, then all commodities bought oil or bought energy dropped in price and, and, and oil actually increased. There were reasons to believe that prices would drop, and, and the reason for that is the slowing down in the rates of growth of the world economy. That's, that's what you have in this, uh, in this uh, uh, graph, uh, slowing down in, in uh, worldwide, and particularly in, in the Far East, China and India. India, the rates of growth, I mean, the growth is still positive. What is negative is the, the acceleration. It's, it's, it, the, the economy is decelerating, and uh, the rates of growth of uh, China over the last uh, two years are roughly half what they were in, do, in, in 2011 and, and 12. And this is uh, what we conclude uh, there. And it's the same for, uh, for uh, 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 growth, uh, for uh, the growth in the demand for crude oil. It, it has been... Uh, uh, falling, and it's uh, well below what it was in uh, in the period up to 2011. That's the red column, and the yellow column is the the rate of growth uh, as from as from 2011, the accelerating uh, demand. Uh, then, why prices remain stable? And uh, and and uh, what is true is that. Uh, in this period, from 2011, there were forces that, far from uh, pushing prices downward as demand was falling, pushed prices upwards. Because there were three cycles that I'm going to show next of severe supply disruptions in the Middle East. And then the, the question would have been the contrary. Why prices didn't go higher? And, and the cycles are these. This is the, 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 the first cycle is when uh, Libya came out of the market with uh, the Libyan revolution that overthrew uh, the regime of Colonel uh, Gaddafi. And the only reason why prices did just increase vis-a-vis -vis the 100 mark line, $20, is because Saudi Arabia Made a, de made a deliberate attempt to stop prices from going up and increase production. And it was announced uh, by, at the time, by uh, Minister Al Naimi that they would do their utmost to avoid prices going much higher than $100. They acted again in the market when the second cycle uh, came up 
in uh, 2012. And that has to do with uh, the sanctions imposed by the OECD countries on Iran as part of their uh, uh, nuclear program. And finally, there is a third cycle. There it is. That's 2013. That uh, then uh, then war broke up in uh, in uh, Libya, and uh, and production in Libya came to a halt. Then uh, Saudi Arabia increased production again. We'll see that in detail in a minute. And now is this fourth cycle that is downward, and we will explain uh, with uh, more detail. This is uh, the the variation in production for these three actors, Saudi Arabia, Libya, and Iran, vis-a-vis -vis their production in January 2011. And you can see here how there is a mirror image of the Saudi production vis-a-vis -vis the Libya and Iran production. Uh, the first uh, downward uh, uh, cycle in, in Libya's production, again with the overthrow of uh, Gaddafi, and, uh, and uh, Arabia, Saudi Arabia increased production by a million barrels. Then, uh, as Libya recovered at the time, Iran came out because the sanctions were imposed as from 20, January 2012. And uh, Saudi Arabia never reduced production, actually increased to close to one and a half million. And finally, the third uh, cycle with when uh, Libya came fully out of the market with the uh, 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 outset of the war and uh, and Saudi Arabia increased again. Then the reason why the price of oil did not fall until 2014, uh, together with other commodities, is not because it, it was not subject of a demand reduction. It was. But at the time, for geopolitical reasons, there were these back-to-back uh, -back disruptions in these important producers in, in North Africa and, and, uh, and, the middle, and, the, and the Middle East. What has happened since uh, uh, that uh, far from Saudi Arabia uh, decreasing production, particularly as prices began falling in mid last year, Saudi Arabia has increased production and has increased production vis-a-vis -vis what it was already, it had already increased vis-a-vis -vis January 2011 by an additional 1 million barrels per day. And this is the Saudi response to the to the uh, to the U.S. Uh, gas revolution, to put it that way, to U.S. increasing production as over the last four or five years that we'll see uh, next. This is uh, OPEC and and Saudi Arabia. And sorry for the blue uh, dot there; should be transparent. But what we want to highlight is how both uh, Saudi Arabia increased a million barrels per day and the rest of OPEC has also increased. So, taken together, uh, OPEC uh, for uh, uh, 2015, for this half a year, far from decreasing production, has increased production by 2 million barrels per day. One, Saudi Arabia, and the rest is uh, essentially Iraq, although there has been some already increase in product, production in Iran, but the, this, the, the rest of non-OPEC did not reduce production try attempting to defend prices. Everyone has either maintained production or increased production, as, is the, as it is the case particularly of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq. Then comes the origin of, the, of this uh, new market paradigm, which is the increase in production in the U.S. First, quite unnoticed until 2011 because the volumes were relatively small, and for the OECD as a whole, uh, the the production in the North Sea was uh, still declining. But uh, uh, the production in the U.S. has increased in force over the last uh, three and a half years since early 2012. It has increased by more than. Uh, 3 million barrels, in, and it has kept increasing until April uh, this year. Production has increased by increase until the end of last year by some 3 million barrels, and uh, it has uh, kept increasing. 
as as January uh, as until fe uh, April, and it is to this increase in U.S. production that the uh, Saudi-led OPEC uh, reacted and didn't open market space and were prepared to fight a, a war and were in the midst of that war for for market share and the the residual will be the 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 the, the price uh, the price will be the consequence of these uh, supply increases here we have the situation in north america and uh, not just that the uh, north sea was declining until uh, uh, 2012 or so, but Mexico had dropped, but Mexico has stabilized its production since uh, uh, early this uh, decade, since 2010 or so, and then we have combined increases in production in the in North America, uh, uh, Canada increased by almost 1 million barrels, and the U.S. that taken together has increased close to 4 million barrels until mid-2015. That's what we have here. Uh, one consequence of this, which is uh, important, is that U.S. imports have decreased by the amount of uh, 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 U.S. incremental production. The U.S. imports have declined by some 3 million barrels uh, per day. And perhaps more important is that uh, the U.S. has become ever more dependent on Canada and Mexico for its supplies, these non-OPEC countries supply in the U.S., and it has been at the expense of uh, imports from uh, 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 OPEC countries, making true the, the 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 objective of all this of uh, uh, security of uh, supply. The U.S. is ever less dependent on supply from the OPEC countries, at it as it has increased is its own production and uh, the neighboring the two neighboring countries uh, first and foremost Canada and then Mexico have increased their own uh, production from the OPEC countries the the ones that have a share are uh, 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 OPEC as are Saudi Arabia and, and Venezuela and part of the increase of Saudi Arabia's production is a, uh, attempting to to make a way into the U.S. Uh, supply, not to lose this uh, uh, participation in the U.S. Uh, 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 domestic consumption. This is the consequence of the war. This is uh, in the blue line, and against the left axis is the number of active rigs, and on the right is the uh, the price and how the drop in price with a lag has affected drilling activity, which in due term affects uh, production in the U.S. However, as you can see there, until uh, uh, a month or so ago, the, 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 uh, the number of drilling rigs seemed to be leveling off. However, these new lower prices are taking some rigs from, from activity, but it seems that the number of active rigs and the process associated to those it's leveling off and that's it's uh, some analysts believe that this contraction of some three hundred thousand dollars per barrel in u.s production from 12 12 and a half to 12.2 million barrels per day uh, will level off at the le will level off at around 12 million barrels let's see how this evolves this is the comment on that and this is uh, how uh, U.S. production increase and the leveling off of U.S. production. Uh, this does not include, this is just crude oil, it does not include condensates and, and uh, natural gas uh, liquids, this nine and a half field. This is just uh, crude oil. And this explains in part why uh, the to the surprise of many people, uh, uh, production has not declined all that fast. It, 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 there hasn't been uh, a, a, a collapse of U.S. production. And the reason for that is that even before prices came down, productivity uh, was increasing in the production of non-conventional oils in the U.S. 
And, and the reason for that is that although the two techniques taken separately has, have been with us for decades, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, the uh, bringing together the two technologies for uh, and creating actually a new technology, uh, which is uh, uh, response to the, the short name of uh, fracking. It's in, still in, in the early stages, and there are big productivity gains to be made. And they were made, and we don't have data for 2015. But again, for the period up to 2014, we still with prices at the hundred dollars level, the number of uh, uh, the time that it took to drill uh, uh, a shell well uh, was reduced uh, 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 to less than half, from 22 to nine days. Uh, and the reverse of that, which is the the, the wells uh, uh, drilled by rig, increased uh, more than twofold. From uh, per year, from 16 to 41, and what is has also been improving in in uh, in productivity, or uh, it's the uh, early production. I mean the, the the fracturing technique as such. I mean the 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 initial production per well it has increased by almost 50 percent from 533 barrels per day to 767, and that's the fracturing techniques. We believe that with a much lower prices uh, and lower margins, these, uh, uh, these productivities are, are increasing. And, and that explains why the drop in production in the US hasn't been as fast as first uh, uh, thought. Uh, another point that I believe it is a finding of the paper is that you would expect, as it has been the case in the U.S., that with lower prices, drilling would uh, drop. I mean, there, there, there would be reasons for making any, or the reasonable behavior or behavior of any producer would be reduce investment and reduce activity. And far from that, Saudi Arabia, then again, coinciding with the drop in prices has increased drilling activity. Uh, as from 2011, increased twofold, but as from uh, mid-2014, the number of rigs has increased by more than one-third. That means that they are preparing for the war and they are increasing spare capacity. In the in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and that explains why they can sustain the increase in production that we have witnessed over the last uh, six months or so. And the same is true of uh, it, uh, neighboring country and an ally in the GCC in the Gulf Cooperation County uh, Council, uh, uh, the the country, the kingdom of Kuwait. In the rest of OPEC, true, uh, drilling activity has fallen, responding to these weaker prices. And uh, this brings us to the, to the uh, end of our uh, presentation. Again, this presentation was prepared some two months ago. Uh, and uh, actually, earlier than that, in, in late April. Uh, that the, the, the market is in the process of finding a, a, a new price, that the price setting mechanism will be the, the it will be a very uh, textbook uh, model with a very Ricardian model with production being uh, or price being uh, set by the least efficient uh, or the marginal uh, producers, which will be in the non-conventional oils of the of the U.S., uh, we said at the time that the most likely scenario was to price for prices to remain on the band between 55 and 65, and there were a number of downside risks that we pointed out. Uh, a full uh, peace accord in Libya that would bring back more than a million barrels to the market. Uh, at the time, 
the what is now a reality that the negotiations uh, and the lifting of uh, uh, the sanctions on Iran, Iran is a reality, and we're in the process of that. Uh, that Saudi Arabia and Kuwait keep increasing production, and um, and uh, uh, marginal producers or the share producers in the U.S. keep making productivity gains. And and uh, last but not least is that demand is is recovering. It's very sluggish. The the demand for uh, for oil and uh, the world economic growth in general, uh, which had been led by China and Asia growth uh, uh, in the uh, commodity super cycle between 2002 and 2011, uh, the, the economy is not going back to those uh, rates of growth. And this is, I believe, the end, the last slide of our presentation. And I thank you, you all very much for, for your kind attention. Thank, thank you so much, Ramon. That was that, that was a wonderful uh, introduction to the topic. And look, I'm going to pass it over to Jeremy for the question and answer session. But just quickly before we do that, I wanted to remind everybody who came on late that we're having a problem. You've probably noticed with our question function. And so if you if you don't mind, just for today, please sending your questions directly to me at alexis a l e x i s at iamericas.org. You could also tweet them at us at IOA underscore energy, and I'll make sure those get to Jeremy uh, so we have plenty of questions for the Q&A session. We also have Carlos Sucre online to answer questions. But um, apologies for the inconvenience, but I hope, I hope you don't mind just for today doing that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alexis, and thanks for uh, for working the back end there and all your, your work on the, the webinar series. Thank you, Ramon, and I know Carlos is online. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions that I, I will jump in with uh, as Alexis fields the questions from the participants online. Let me start with, um, if you don't mind, Canada. I, I'm curious to, uh, to get both of your input and feedback on where you see the oil sands in this analysis, um, and maybe not just the oil sands, but let's just take more broadly large capital projects, major projects, including projects such as the oil sands, where do they fit in, in your rebalanced market? market? Do we answer question by question? Yeah, do you want to, you want to go ahead and take I believe yeah, yeah. that and then yes, you Yes, I, I just wanted to let you know that the problem you have will be resolved as soon as you, we finish. We hired some hackers to measure your, your uh, system uh, because we didn't want any questions, but we, um, we didn't know how uh, that you would react so fast having the Twitter and the, and the email, but let's, let's keep going. Uh, um, uh, okay. As with any other oil project, uh, one thing is operational costs and uh, the other is uh, investment costs. Then for production that's, that is uh, underway in Canada, uh, the operational costs are, I don't know whether much below, but are below this 45, then no uh, present production will be shut in. What I'm sure, and, and, and we had the chance to go to, to uh, the province of Alberta for other matters some uh, couple of months ago, uh, and um, uh, what they told us is that uh, uh, all new investments would be put uh, on hold uh, uh, and, uh, because those are really capital intensive. And and we're uh, and and at this uh, 45 to 65 margin, let's put it that way, uh, are 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 uh, are marginal. Um, and and again, it's very different. And and I emphasize, perhaps I, I I don't emphasize this enough, that production in the in the non-conventional conventional oils in the U.S. is much more flexible than in this huge. Uh, Capital investments in in places such as the Brazil, the the Canadian tar sands or the pre salt in 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 Brazil that is a single project can be uh, several hundred uh, million dollars. Instead, uh, drilling a, a shell well is like 
I don't know, $7 million, you see, then it, it is, at the end of the day, it's becoming much more flexible production, uh, marginal production in the U.S. than either in Canada or, uh, or Brazil, or most probably deep, deep, uh, deep water in the Gulf of, uh, on the Mexican side of the Gulf of Mexico. Then these new investments, for the time being, will be put on hold until uh, uh, completely understanding which is the, 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 the price fixing mechanism from now on. Hello? Yep, yeah, sorry, we I had to mute you to yeah, not sorry, get feedback. Um, uh, I want to follow up on that because there's a couple of follow-on questions, uh, and I and I've got a couple here on email. I'm trying to sort through as well. So let me let me you make a good point about sort of the the new projects versus versus the uh, the ones that are already in operation. So. And, and then you also mentioned something I want to co go back to, Ramon. You, you mentioned how there actually has been, uh, um, you know, a couple of months since a lot of this analysis and data crunching was done. Um, I don't know if I heard this or not, so help me uh, make sure. Does this latest downturn, does this $45, now that we're at 45 or so, does this change anything in some of your, uh, your earlier analysis and outlook? Uh, um, it makes uh, certain what we asserted here. No, no, it does not. Okay, excellent. We said at the time that the, I mean, the downside was much uh, probable than the upside, and and that has come true. To a question. Um, in terms of incentive costs, there was a question that I'll, I'll read uh, about incentive costs for new oil projects uh, and, and why shouldn't we think about this price as the more relevant price in the medium term given natural decline rates in existing fields throughout the world and especially in the U.S.? Or, Ramon, are you saying that incentive cost is between $55 and $65? And, then, and a final point to this question is related to this, why um, it, why the U.S. is so relevant if we still have an export ban on crude oil? The, the U.S. is export ban on crude oil that's still in place. Uh, first, that uh, uh, the the increase in production in the U.S. is affecting the world market because the U.S. is exporting is is importing much less. You see, it is not necessary for you to be an exporter. Uh, a net exporter to become to affect the market. It, it, you are affecting the market because you were by far and still are the first world importer of oil, but the volume imported is much lower. Then that's that's a, a, a surplus for the rest of the of the of the world. And as you know, uh, the the ban on exports is about to be lifted, and the U.S. will be exporting light crudes. At least with to Mexico, I don't know the details of of uh, where it will be fully lifted, but they, they are to allow exports of light oil to Mexico, which are much needed in Mexico, by the way, to to dilute their very heavy oil and send uh, uh, lighter mix to the to the refineries in the in the U.S. It is true that traditional fields are declining in the U.S., but the potential for growth of these uh, non-conventional oils, as, as, as reality shown, is, is really large, you see. And the total amount of recoverable, recoverable reserves in these fields is still to be, to be determined. But it's, it's much higher than uh, first thought of. Then you could keep with production in the US of crude oil above the $10 million, uh, 10 million barrels per day mark for several years to come, and that will affect the rest of the of the equation. Yeah, 
Excellent. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm reading all these questions we're getting by email, so bear with me. Uh, your hackers did a wonderful job, and uh, congratulations. They, uh, the, wherever they're based, I, I congratulate them for taking down our chat system. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, a question about uh, this comes with regards to Argentina. And the question is, are productivity and efficiency gains in U.S. unconventionals good for Argentina? And the second part of it, does this mean Vaca Muerta has an edge on competition from the pre-salt or the deep water in the Mexican Gulf? So uh, we're, we'll take a lot of hemispheric pieces here uh, and, and put it all together and get your insights, Ramon. Um, um, different in, in the sense that uh, Vaca Muerta is mostly gas and the pre-salt and uh, offshore Mexico are oil. Uh, no doubt uh, 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 future uh, 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 shale gas, uh, shale uh, hydrocarbons development outside in the, in the future, outside of the US will benefit of this, no doubt, will benefit of these uh, uh, technological improvements. And they will be quotes quite available in the market, again, because it are being developed by a number of uh, rather small uh, companies that would be prepared to for a fee to share their, their uh, uh, technologies. And then in that regard, <coughs> uh, potential oil production in Baca Muerta could compete very favorably with uh, uh, offshore, uh, uh, with a pre-salt or, uh, or uh, offshore uh, Gulf of Mexico. And again, the, 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 as the technologies are quite different, the, the, the two big offshore pro, uh, provinces, uh, Pre-Salt and, and Gulf of Mexico, will require discrete, huge investments. Instead, uh, the, the non-conventionals in Argentina also, you will be able to develop quite gradually increasing investment over time. Thank you. Uh, no, I think that comes back to one of the first questions I asked, and you clearly laid out in terms of the oil sands, but in terms of large capital projects. So, so Ramon, a, a question about Saudi Arabia and, and OPEC and, and some of the pressures within, within OPEC. Let me, uh, let me just pose to you sort of a broad question. It probably would be the best one to end with, but we'll put it up here for now. Now, um, how long will Saudi Arabia, how long do you forecast this posture in this position of Saudi Arabia? What kind of pressure is being exerted within OPEC to, to do something? For example, I mean, I think it's pretty clear Venezuela is exerting some pressure. How do you, how do you forecast the, this position and posture of Saudi Arabia in terms of the market? Thank you, Jeremy, because that's a key question. Now there are, to there are talkings and there have been uh, affecting the market, these uh, talks of a potential uh, um, uh, production agreements uh, within OPEC and, and with uh, key producers. And my impression is that the only country that will make any posture from the OPEC side credible is Saudi Arabia. It's the only country that can actually cut production by some two million barrels and affect prices. And I think that is, it's difficult to believe that now that finally the Saudi strategy is working out and US production is beginning to decline, will the Saudis uh, give up? I mean, that, that to me, it's, it's, it's uh, self-defeating in the sense that uh, uh, it, it wouldn't make any sense that increasing production to, to, to bring prices down to force the reduction of the U.S. producers and, quote, be, be winning the war, at this moment, uh, Saudi Arabia is going to, to move backwards from its posture. That's number one. And number two, for any international coalition to, to be credible, you would need two key actors. Perhaps not because of volumes, but by what they represent outside OPEC. One is Russia, and the other one is Mexico. Russia produces in rubles, okay? 
and the rubles have devaluated vis-a-vis -vis the dollar by by some 50 percent for as U.S. Ex, uh, 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 Russia's exports have declined. Then the dollar-denominated cost of production in Russia has been reduced by close to half. Then they somehow are 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 compensating lower prices with much lower cost of production. That's in the case of of Russia, and I I wouldn't go alone in this unless Saudi Arabia was on board. And 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 the third actor, which is Mexico, and 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 I don't believe Mexico. I mean that that uh, it, to me, and I'm sure for the Mexicans, doesn't make any sense. On the one hand, for this year, Mexico hedged a good deal of its production at eighty-seven dollars. Then they are still getting eighty-seven, in spite of the prices being whatever they are, fifty or forty-five. That's number one. And number two, Mexico is in the midst of an opening then it, it would be the worst of signals for Mexico to curtail production at this moment to defend prices. Then any sort of, uh, I, be, I see really difficult, in spite of growing pressures uh, from the key actors in this, uh, in this war to, to, uh, to change their, their announced strategies. Uh, I come back to Mexico um, just a little bit. There's two more things to, 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 to get to, but first, I know Carlos Sucre is on the line, and, and, and I don't know, Ramon, if, if you want to have Carlos weigh in at all. Uh, and Carlos, if there's anything you want to add to any of these questions, I'm sorry I should have asked you earlier, but, but uh, I'll, you know, please weigh in, 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 in as much as you'd like to. Don't worry, Jeremy. On, that, on the Russia um, deal, um, they actually have said already, uh, Ros the president of Rosneft said that Russia can't cut production artificially. And so I don't, I, I would really rule them out of any attempt to side with the Iranians to, and Venezuelans to uh, artificially lower production to prop up the price. That's, that's probably a non-starter. The same thing with Mexico. I agree with Ramon completely. As they open their, their sector, they're not going to to be lower in production when they're exactly trying to do the opposite. No, and, and I, I would have a question though. Mexico, obviously, like for, as Ramon indicated, the PR signal of of any kind of. I mean, the last thing Mexico wants to do is about talk about production cuts, right? So, uh, given the the last ten years, not to mention the opening, Ramon on the hedge. Um, is that their entire export uh, production, or, or how does clarify a little bit of what Mexico does in terms of the hedge, if you if you could? They they secure uh, production ex ante. Uh, they they hedge. Uh, uh, they pay for uh, a set price. This year was I don't know how much of their production, but or the exports, but a good deal of their exports are hedge. At a certain price, they hedge at uh, eighty-seven dollars. Then uh, they secure that price for that oil. If the 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 the, the price is at that level or lower, they lose the what they paid. But if it is as this is the case, and they have done that for many for many years, they have been hedging uh, a good a share of their of their exports. And, and, and in, in situations like, like this, it has saved Mexico, I don't know, half their, their revenue in, in terms of exports. Right, thank you. Uh, so, so about Mexico, I want to dial in a tiny bit more. In terms of your analysis, I mean, obviously in the near term, the, the, there's, there's uh, the opening underway, there's the round one. Um, where where do you see, I mean, and again, this is a bit of a crystal ball question, but where and when do you see significant production from Mexico coming uh, into the market? Um, and where, where does that fit in, if at all, in your analysis? Because uh, the first uh, uh, area has been open to, to bidding, uh, have been in the uh, shallow waters in the south of the countries of the country, and, uh, and volume increases there are 
not that big. I mean, big production will come once they open up uh, um, the deep water Gulf of Mexico. And even there, it will take many years. Then we shouldn't expect for the next, I don't know, two or three years, any substantial increase in, in Mexico's uh, crude production. Substantial. Let's say in the order of 10 to 15%. So let's let's end. Thank you, thank you for that. And I think you know we we are all curious and waiting to see what happens with the deep water and and, and that bidding that's going to happen some point in the next six to eight months and and what the timelines will be on that. Um, a question that that maybe can wrap all of this up, and it's part of what I think you talked about in your conclusions. But if you both could could end with some thoughts on what happens with Iran? I mean, it's again sort of a, a bit of a crystal ball as well, but what what is the potential, what's realistic to expect um, in a post, once sanctions are lifted, once the deal goes ahead, let's say it does, in terms of Iran's potential production? Shall I go first? Give you yeah. the last word. Uh, Iran's shot in production shot in production at this moment is in the order of half a million, six hundred thousand barrels. And they I believe they will increase that quite rapidly. Beyond that, uh, they will have to wait for new investments and it will take time. The other country that for us is key and is not much mentioned is Libya. Uh, I don't know how long it will take to reach a political agreement and stabilize the country. But once that happened, uh, Libya could uh, prop up production quite rapidly. And that would have an effect on, on the brand crude because that the bulk of Libya's production because of economies of, of location go to Europe. And that would be affecting the European uh, market. And the third uh, country that at present actually is the Second produ producer within OPEC is Iraq, and Iraq will keep increasing production because they have huge debts, to, uh, war debts, to pay back. Then uh, uh, these three countries I would keep an eye on. Uh, Iran, I think they, they can increase within the next two or three years the half uh, million barrels they, they have shot in then Libya and, and Iran will keep on increasing. I Iraq will keep on increasing. Thank you. No, I, I, thanks for mentioning, you know, obviously Iraq, but especially Libya. Uh, you're right that, that oftentimes does not fall uh, into the, the question of the countries that are discussed. So I appreciate you citing that and mentioning it. And Carlos, yeah, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. And Yes, yes, yes. Ramon. Jeremy, let me make a, on my side a final remark, which I Absolutely. think it is key for this debate. And it's what we understand by low price, you see. The price this morning is 45, uh, 50, I don't know, thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, the average price in today's dollars between 86 and 2002 was $33. Uh, in today's dollars. And the average price for the whole of the 20th century was $27. Then price today is 30% uh, uh, higher than it was for these 15 years prior 2002, and it's almost 80% uh, higher than the price, the average price we had last century. I understand that. Uh, 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 there is exhaustion, but there are also new technologies. Technologies, you see. Then the 45 price is quite higher than the the price we had for the last 120 years prior to to the to the turn of the century. That's 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 one. And two, it is true that is half the price we had for these uh, four years between 20. Uh, 2011 and 2014, but those were abnormal years because you had these uh, huge disruptions in the in the Middle East. You see, then perhaps what is not the norm is that the high prices 
and the super cycle uh, i it is i mean most people agree that it's difficult we will have a such a commodity super cycle as big as the one we had in the 10 years between 02 and 11 you see then let's put this price before uh, arguing that it's too low a price in historical perspective, mm -hmm. and we will realize that it's not that low. I, no, I, I really appreciate you making that point, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a very interesting one in historical terms. Um, it's double, if not, uh, you know, 50% or so more than, than historical average. But I guess, did, did I hear you say that so 2011 to 2014 was, a, was sort of an outlier period, perhaps? Yes, Perhaps. that's what I'm saying. I don't want to misquote yes. you here. Okay, uh, Carlos, uh, I'll throw it to you, and then we'll wrap up in in, uh, in in wrap up the discussion today. And again, Ramon, yeah. thank you so much. Carlos, thank you. Uh, wonderful analysis. Yeah, no, just to close, I think we have to we should start thinking about a price ceiling instead of a price floor. You know, the pressures for the price to go up are essentially just demand recovering and 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 that driving up demand and, and 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 driving up the price but at some point if the price does recover to a to a certain level all these marginal producers in the US will return will come back and we'll see a spike in production in the United States again so we may have to start thinking where is the ceiling instead of where is the floor uh for price maybe for the next as we say in the in the in the paper over the next four years, uh, give or take. Um, so, so yeah. So the the scenario for the price going down is 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 easier to draw than the price for the than the scenario for the price going up. Uh, you've got Libya offline, Iran offline, and whenever the pr uh, and and all those those producers will come will come online as Ramon said. Uh, you know, in the short you know eighteen month horizons. So. Let's. I think we we should start thinking about that side of the equation. Is demand going to come back? If it does, what does that do to price? And if the price does go up, then more producers come online, and that brings it back down again. So I think we're going to be in this range for 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 a little while at least. Excellent. No, thank you. So where where well, let's focus more on ceiling instead of floor. And uh, obviously, there's a lot of questions that, uh, that that you all have pointed to to keep our eyes on, whether it's country specific or or, or other uh, geo geopolitical and geographic factors. So, uh, Ramon Espinasa and Carlos Sucre from the IDB's Energy Division, thanks for taking the time to share your analysis with us, and we look forward to uh, to further analysis. And I believe Ramon mentioned at the outset that uh, there'll be another paper uh, that will be prepared for a presentation to the IDB Board of Directors. So, we look forward to getting that. And and keeping this conversation going, and and when uh, when oil prices go all the way back to the ceiling again, we'll uh, we'll get you back on to explain just exactly why it all happened. So, thanks everyone <laughs> thanks, for bearing with us uh, with our technical challenge this morning, and appreciate you sending the questions by email, and we appreciate everyone's attention and uh, and participation as always in the Institute of the Americas Energy webinar series. And don't forget to join us in person at some of our upcoming events. We've got a program in Panama City just a little bit later this month, so September 22nd, and talked a little bit earlier about the pre-salt, and we're going to have a, a small roundtable, half-day roundtable in Brazil, October 23rd, and then it's never too early to plan for the La Jolla Conference. In fact, next year is the 25th annual, May 25th and 26th of 2016. So uh, come see us in person or, again, online. We'll get in touch as we have further details on upcoming webinars and other programming. Thank you so much. Have a great day.